Well, friends, it's good to see you all. Um, we've been waiting a year to be able to say that, as many are joining us here in the chapel and many are joining us online. Welcome to Westminster Seminary, California, and 2021 Robert G. and Nellie B. Dendolk Lectures on Pastoral Ministry. For those of you who don't know this series, we've been hosting the series since 1993, named after the second president of Westminster Seminary, California, and his wife, who are, who are instrumental in the founding of the school and the continuing health and flourishing of our institution as well. This lecture series was set up as we honor uh, uh, the, the life's ministry of the Dendolks in order to bring in experienced pastors to teach us, inspire us, and to be an example for us, not only for the faculty, but the students here preparing for a ministry in the churches, for them to teach us during their time here and to be encouraged by them. We are delighted this year that we have uh, uh, Reverend Dr. Kim Ritterbarger joining us. His wife, Mickey, is here with us as well. We're so grateful that they're here together taking time off. He al already taught two hours this morning, and I realize that this is going to be a long day, so your prayers are appreciated. Yesterday, I had a chance to share with you his credentials and background, 25 years at Christ Reformed Church, all his education and the publications that he has, and obviously uh, the, the new task of becoming a granddad, the most important one, at least at this point in time. But as we think about the, uh, the example of men who are here teaching us in this series, I just want to point out a couple things that I find wonderful for us to reflect upon as we invite Kim up to speak for us. On the one hand, I think Kim is a wonderful example of a pastor scholar who balances pastoral ministry and a heart for the people of God, at the same time, the ongoing learning of, of pastors in their lifetime. Uh, seminary is not the end of all education, it's just simply the beginning. And as we continue to see many examples before us, I do think Kim is a wonderful example for us. We also appreciate and are grateful to the Lord for men who have ministered well throughout their life. We realize that there are many aspirations and goals that we might have, but finishing the race well is certainly a t on top of my prayer list, and I'm sure many of yours as well. And to see men like him finish well, we're so grateful. I realize he's not done. Probably 30 more years of labors uh, in the theological arena, but grateful for that. And, 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 and lastly, for us to think about Theological friendships. Last night, we had a chance to talk about all the friends that were encouragers to him and Mickey as they ministered for the last three decades. We realized the importance of finding friends here. He was here the first years of Westminster Seminary, California, students with Steve Ball, and later on, church planting with Mike Horton. These are all the blessings that the Lord provides us with, and may the Lord bless you during your seminary years here that he will bring alongside you co-workers with whom you may labor for the rest of your life. These are all the things that I admire about my friend Kim, and we're delighted to welcome him back for his second lecture today titled Preaching and Systematic Theology. Let's welcome him. Thank you very much, President Kim. It's an honor to be back. I'm going to begin, however, a little sip of water. In this, our second lecture, we'll be talking about preaching and systematic theology. And so I'll discuss the importance of teaching our congregation sound doctrine, especially since we live in an age of great cultural and societal disruption and doctrinal ignorance and apathy. Since the Bible is filled with theological content revealed redemptive historically, not topically, it's important for us, whenever it is called for by the text upon which we are preaching, to connect the theological dots. Now, before going any further, I don't think a sermon should be structured as a doctrinal treatise, nor serve as a replacement for the practice of catechesis. In fact, one of the great treasures of our tradition is the availability of excellent catechisms and confessions. And much of what I'm calling for in this lecture should be supported by the continual practice of catechesis of church members. But given the concerns raised in my previous lecture about preaching apologetically, a fair amount of doctrinal content in our sermons might just be in order 
especially when we consider the number of times the Bible speaks of the importance of sound doctrine as a corrective to error and ignorance and apathy. The goal of developing a theologically literate congregation is a worthy one, and it's not at all a hindrance to growth or to community. Now, I know that our hearers prefer that we get right down to practical application and just skip the doctrine stuff. They want us to affirm their current opinions and convictions. And this, as you know, is a common lament coming from many quarters, but it comes loudly from those influenced by the various religious impulses that contribute to the DNA of contemporary American spirituality and which I identified in my previous lecture. These contributors of spiritual DNA include, but certainly not limited to, the Sheilaists, the moralistic therapeutic deists, civil religionists, and critical and social justice theorists. My contention is that at least part of the situation we are in is that far too often and far too willingly churches cave in to what is an unreasonable concern, that we downplay doctrinal teaching to get to the practical stuff because that's what people want us to do. Somehow, knowing the truth isn't seen as practical. We also know that those who've taken the subjective turn don't like it very much when God summons them through preaching to look outside themselves. So the temptation is strong and faced by the preacher commonly, not to disturb those who don't want to be disturbed. Now, the importance of framing our preaching in light of the categories given in systematic theology, which is a real strength of our tradition, is especially relevant in light of the necessity of preaching apologetically, which I defined in my prior lecture as proclaiming the Christian faith as a truth claim grounded in specific historical events, all of which culminate in the person and work of Jesus Christ, his incarnation, his death, his resurrection, his ascension, and so on. Now, a direct connection between the truth of the Christian faith and its doctrines is one of the real peculiarities of Christianity, because our key doctrines are often historical facts. B.B. Warfield pointed out the obvious when he declared that the resurrection of Christ is the fundamental fact of Christianity. And so an event which occurred as a fact is at the same time the content of the faith we confess. If Christ be not raised, then there's no object for our faith to embrace. Now, much the same holds true for other historical necessities. As Francis Schaeffer once said of Christ's cross, that if you'd rubbed your hands across, across the cross of Christ, you'd get splinters. And there are a host of factual occurrences that are loaded with doctrinal significance. Historical events recounted in scripture, such as our Lord's bodily resurrection, were carbaryl claws and 40 pounds of spices, and a hand-cut empty tomb because these are matters of history. They occurred. Jesus' ascension was witnessed by his disciples. And at the same time, these occurrences are tied directly to fundamental doctrines essential to God's redemptive purposes. He was raised on the third day. If God did and said the things recorded in the Bible, such as our Lord rising in him bodily from the grave, then Christianity is true. And the claim which God makes upon all those who hear his words stands, despite the objections of any who think sound doctrine is not necessary, nor an important foundation for Christian living, or who tell us that the accidental truths of history cannot rise to the level of universals, or because they have an opinion or feeling about something, that opinion or feeling carries far more weight than objective reality. As I mentioned last time, nature trumps topo map. Now, throughout the New Testament, we are repeatedly warned about direct and fierce opposition to the Christian faith and its central doctrines, all of which remind us that we are sinners in desperately need of saving. Now, that sin requires a number of big picture categories, which so many of our contemporaries have either forgotten or openly reject. And so with that point in mind, I'm going to begin by surveying some of the warnings in the New Testament about challenges raised by false doctrine and unbelief. Then I'll spend the balance of our time in this lecture and the next identifying several of these 
overarching big picture categories that are necessary to equip our hearers to resist the challenges uniquely associated with our age, especially those raised by contemporary American spirituality. And I'll be making points of application as we go along. <clears throat> so we begin with a survey of warnings about false doctrine given in the New Testament that center around the rejection of, confusion about, or opposition to specific Christian doctrines and teaching. Now, many of these warnings resound today. And so Paul, for example, facing impending death in a Roman jail, penned his last words to Timothy, which come as both a warning and an exhortation about this very point. In 2 Timothy chapter, two, uh, chapter 3, beginning at verse 12, Paul tells Timothy, Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which were able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scriptures breathed out by God, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be competent, equipped for every good work. Since scripture is God-breathed, that is, it has its origin in the will of God, this establishes the Bible as the source of all Christian doctrine and practice. God speaks, he instructs, he commands in Scripture. And the sacred writings then are the basis for all Christian proclamation and are the sole standard by which we evaluate it. But this word is external. We read it or we hear it proclaimed to us. But contemporary American spirituality takes the subjective turn, urging us to look within to hear a divine word or to develop the use of spiritual technology as we seek to discover hidden spiritual principles which bring enlightenment and or more intense religious experience. Now preceding Paul's discussion of scripture as God breed, Paul warned Timothy about 17 vices which will characterize the people of the Greco-Roman world in which they both must live and minister. And so in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 5, we find this list from Paul to Timothy. But understand this, that in the last days there will come times of difficulty, for people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, Brutal, not loving good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having the appearance of God, godliness, but denying its power. Avoid such people. Well, since the last days, which I take to be a reference to the final epoch in human history, had already dawned when Paul issues this warning to Timothy, we shouldn't be surprised to find such vices reflected in contemporary American spirituality. Now, granted, we all struggle with these same vices, but as Christians, we know to call them sin. We know not to create a religious justification so as to make practicing these vices somehow appear to be virtuous. Now, in addition, there is a litany of false doctrines that spring from within the sinful human imagination that are kind of based around these very uh, vices. Throughout his letters, Paul warns us of Judaizers. Think specifically the book of Galatians. He warns of a form of proto-Gnosticism, the Colossian heresy, of those who teach that the resurrection had already occurred in 2 Timothy 2. Those who die before the Lord returns miss out on the resurrection, 1 Thessalonians 4. Or even that the day of the Lord had already come, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul cautions us to be on guard for a different gospel, a different Jesus, a different spirit. And all of these warnings, of course, reflect a particular historical context unique to the apostolic churches receiving Paul's letters. 
but the manner in which these false doctrines are addressed by Paul extends to the church's ongoing mission until her Lord returns again. Then there are the warnings that come from Jesus, which we can but briefly survey. In Matthew's Gospel, Jesus warns his disciples that doctrinal disputes will be part and parcel of the mission of the church, which he is then founding. So taking his disciples up on the Mount of Olives on the night before his passion intensifies, Jesus informs the twelve that they will encounter a number of false prophets who will make specious claims that deny the claims that Jesus is then making about himself. And so in Matthew 24, verses 4 to 5, Jesus warns them, See that no one leads you astray. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ, and they will lead many astray. Now the issue Jesus raises is false doctrine, specifically false claims made by others, claiming to fulfill the messianic office which Jesus himself was then fulfilling. The false Christ teach falsely about the true Christ. And speaking of false Christ, there are warnings in John's epistles about the spirit of Antichrist, which is the denial that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh. This is a sort of incipient docetism. Jesus appears to be human while being truly God. Now, according to John, the Antichrist is not strictly an end times foe. He's not even necessarily an individual, but a heresy a heresy already facing the apostolic churches. And we're warned about him, the Antichrist, because we're likely going to encounter him. Now, even from the briefest of surveys regarding these warnings, and there are a whole host of other texts we could consider, it's apparent that sound doctrine is essential to the Christian life and to the health and vitality of Christ's church. And these warnings ought to make it very clear to us that sound doctrine is going to be challenged whenever the gospel is preached. Those challenges come with the gospel territory, especially when devotees of contemporary American spirituality are, are present in our churches or else whispering in the ears of our church members. Now, granted, Christianity's narrow way is difficult. And because it is, there's always the incentive to broaden the path to lessen the offense. Preaching about Christian doctrine in a logical and systematic manner is a sure way to keep the path straight, even if the path has to stay narrow. Now, in light of these warnings, in the balance of this lecture and in the next, I'll take up some of these big picture categories that are revealed in the Word of God. And I do this to make a point. The doctrines of the Christian faith are found throughout the entirety of the Bible. Now, whether you as a preacher use the Lectio Continua expository form of preaching, or whether you preach textual topical sermons, no doubt you're going to be preaching upon texts that are rich in doctrinal content. And so the problem then facing the preacher is that often those facts that are key doctrines may seem to occur in isolation from one another. And that requires some sort of a systematic exposition and cross-referencing to make these doctrines intelligible. And especially that's the case when we're seeking to find suitable application from these texts. And so preaching often requires finding the doctrinal dots in the text and then connecting them to the other doctrinal dots in Scripture. And the doctrines found in the text can and should further be fleshed out additionally through regular Bible study or catechesis. Now, the big picture categories that we ought to keep before us are simply creation, fall, redemption, and recreation. But behind these big picture categories, grounded in the redemptive history, is God, who created all things and ordained all that transpires in the world that he has made. And so the survey that follows is not intended to simply rehearse a bunch of proof texts you already know, but to make the point that fundamental doctrines are often revealed in many biblical passages found widely throughout the scriptures. And we cannot escape these passages, nor should we ignore the doctrines that they reveal. And so we need to be thinking about ways to connect our texts to other texts when we preach. And so to illustrate this, let's start at the beginning. The Bible opens with a remarkably bold assertion in Genesis 1-1. It 
in the beginning, God. And that simple assertion leads to several very fundamental truths of the Christian faith. And it's essential to give them their due consideration because these truths stand in direct opposition to much of contemporary American spirituality. Genesis 1.1 tells us that before anything was created, God already was. In fact, God always was, without beginning or end. And since God alone is uncreated, we speak of him as eternal. God exists before time. He's not bound by the succession of moments as we are, since we are in time and are creatures. He is other than we. He is absolutely transcendent. And so as the creation account unfolds in the subsequent verses of Genesis uh, chapter 1 on into verse 3 of chapter 2, we learn that the eternal God creates all things. Whatever now exists, exists only because God created it. He gives created things their purpose, their meaning, their identity. There's no such thing as eternal convulsing of matter ever expanding, ever contracting as is taught in much of contemporary science. There is no eternal realm of mental forms or ideas, as Plato claimed, like existing like mere shadows on a fire, uh, illumined by a fire in the wall of Plato's cave. There's only the true and triune God who created all things, who already was in the beginning, and nothing exists, exists apart from the will of God. All created things, the heaven and the earth, humans as well as angels, are necessarily contingent and dependent upon God for their existence. But yet that's the very thing contemporary American spirituality seeks to reject. A supposedly static and transcendent God who is distinct from the world who is far from us. They demand a very imminent God. A God who usually resembles the face looking back at them from their mirror. Now, unlike his creatures who are bound by both time and space, God has no such limitations. And because God is unlike us in this fundamental way, he must be distinct from that which he has created and can in no sense be dependent upon created things. God has no needs, as do we. God has no parts, as do we. And although personal, God does not have, does not have the kind of passions or emotions that we do. This is the God who creates and then gives orders to the sun and the stars who gives life to inanimate matter as when he made Adam from the dust of the earth. This God utterly transcends his creatures. This otherness of God, this fundamental difference between God and his creatures is known as the creator-creature distinction. And this is one of the most fundamental points of Christian theology and it must be very clear to us before we can meaningfully talk about any other aspect of the Christian faith. Herman Bovink was absolutely right to contend that this, this creator-creature distinction is the starting point of true religion. Christian theism stands opposed to both monism, the idea that reality flows out of or is an extension of God's being, and dualism, that spirit and matter are said to be opposing emanations, entities or forces that are always in conflict with one another. And if you preach through Genesis, for example, these points should be raised because these are the obvious implications of the text. The God of the Bible is the chief obstacle to all modern forms of subjective religion and spirituality. And that subjective turn, at the end of the day, amounts to turning within to get away from the God who is. So it'll come as no surprise that it is the creator-creature distinction which adherents of contemporary American spirituality reject and which their teachers desperately try and erase from the thinking of their converts. You know, forget about all that God stuff you learned about in your Sunday school days. Those who have taken the subjective turn, reality then is one. Every person and creature ebbs and flows in eternal flux God is not distinct from his creations. Human are not significantly distinct from the divine. And when we die, they tell us we just pass away and return to the cosmic flux, perhaps to reappear again. Is it any wonder that so many of our contemporaries embrace some form of reincarnation or think to themselves that they possess some sort of a mysterious attribute that allows them to 
watch over and come to the aid of those who are left behind after they die. Grandma's watching. She's like an angel in heaven. The parallels to the ancient Greco-Roman religions are readily apparent, and they've even become a selling point to tell folks interested in contemporary American spirituality that modern forms of spirituality actually reflect ancient religions, religions which were pure and possessed a natural wisdom and which thrived until pushed off the stage by Christian missionaries, most of whom were white Europeans and who opposed an alien religion upon them. You've heard this. Well, the next big picture category is the triune God. It's common to hear people claim that Christians and Jews and Muslims worship the same God, the so-called Abrahamic faiths. Unlike those who serve Allah or those Jews who claim to worship the God of Abraham, Christians worship the true and living God who reveals himself in three distinct persons as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's been said that the Holy Trinity is Christianity's most distinctive doctrine. Although in many ways the doctrine of the Trinity is beyond our comprehension, we believe this doctrine because this is how God reveals himself to us in his word, as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are the one true God. Now, admittedly, the doctrine of the Trinity is a difficult topic to discuss because it stretches the limits of human language and logic. Despite the difficulties that this doctrine presents to us, we believe and confess that God is triune because this is how God reveals himself to us. The three persons of the Godhead are revealed as equal in divinity and glory and majesty. Each of the three persons are expressly called God in the New Testament. And to each of them are assigned the same divine attributes as well as the same glory and majesty which are ascribed to the other persons of the Blessed Trinity. So... Let me briefly rehearse the diverse biblical data supporting this doctrine for reasons I'll explain shortly. So bear with me as you go through a category of biblical texts. The scriptures, first of all, are absolutely clear there's only one God. In Deuteronomy 6.4, Moses declares, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. In Isaiah 44, verse 6, we read, I am the first and the last. Besides me, there is no God. And this same assertion is found throughout the New Testament, even though we learn that at least three distinct persons in the Godhead are the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In 1 Corinthians 8, verses 4 to 6, Paul writes these words, There is no God but one, although there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth. Indeed, there are many gods and many lords, lowercase for both. Yet for us, there's one God, the Father, from whom all things from whom are all things and for whom we exist. And one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. And elsewhere, James writes, You believe that God is one. You do well. Even the demons believe and shudder. The scriptures are crystal clear. There is but one God. Yet the Bible teaches that although there is one God, he's revealed in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And the three persons of the Godhead are mentioned together throughout the New Testament. And so when Jesus is baptized by John the Baptist, the Father declares, This is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. Even as the Spirit of God descended upon Jesus as a dove. In Matthew 28, 19, Jesus commands his disciples to go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. One name persons. The mission of the church is to go into the world making disciples by baptizing them in the name singular of the persons of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Then in his benediction to his second Corinthian letter, Paul blesses his readers in the name of the triune God. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I almost want to put my hand and dismiss you from worship after reading that. In John 14, 6, Jesus informs the disciples that the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things. And then Luke speaks of the Holy Spirit as God in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 through 4. And in John's Gospel, Jesus speaks of the Holy Spirit and the Father as equals. Now, another line of evidence for the Trinity in the Bible is that the same divine attributes and glory and majesty are assigned to each of the three persons of the Godhead. 
The scriptures teach that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal. According to Isaiah, God says, I am the first and the last. And Paul adds that God is eternal in Romans chapter 16, verse 26. That is, without beginning or end. John records the Son saying, I am the first and the last in Revelation chapter 22. And Micah notes in chapter 5, verse 2 of his uh, prophetic book, his coming and going are from everlasting. In Hebrews, you read that the Holy Spirit is the eternal spirit, Hebrews 9, 14. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are eternal without beginning or end. The scriptures also speak of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit creating all things. And Paul states, God who created all things, while the psalmist declares, know the Lord. He is God. It's he who's made us, and we are his, the famous 100th Psalm. Yet in John's gospel, we read of the Son. All things were made through Jesus. Without him was not anything made that was made. John chapter 1, verse 3. In Colossians 1, 15 to 17, Jesus writes, or Paul writes that Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he's before all things, and in him all things hold together. And then in Job we read of the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of of the Lord has made me. In Genesis 1.1, we read that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And so the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are said to create all things. Well, we can say of the Father, we can say of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, yet they remain three distinct persons. So even from that kind of flyover brief survey of the biblical data regarding the Trinity, it is apparent that this doctrine is found widely throughout scripture the pentateuch the psalms the prophets the gospels the epistles and that's my point we're going to encounter these doctrinally loaded passages regularly in our preaching and because the trinity is a distinctly biblical doctrine which requires a systematic explanation it falls to us as preachers to explain this data to our hearers so they understand there's one god who exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who are equal in glory, majesty, and power. And we do this because this doctrine appears throughout the biblical text. And yet, the triune God is not the God of contemporary American spirituality. So when James Davison Hunter pointed out in his 2010 book, To Change the World, quoting, that the dominant public witness of the Christian churches in America since the early 1980s has been a political witness, we should, not, we should be very, very concerned. There is a reason why non-Christians are better informed about the politics of most Christians than they are about the fact that Christians believe and confess that God is triune. And that fundamental doctrine found throughout all of Scripture, the Trinity, remains unheard of by so many outside the church, and why would our non-Christian friends think that the church's witness was essentially political? We have to ask a hard question. Can it be that we're the ones communicating to this, whether intentionally or not? Yes, to preach that there's one God who exists in three persons is going to cause many eyes to roll out of boredom or indifference. And it may even provoke, uh, provoke the anti-apologetic, the subjective religious opinionating that replies... Well, that might be how you understand God, but I think God is like. This doctrine is found throughout the whole of Scripture, and it requires a fair bit of systematic explanation and dot connecting. Now, we can do this with a number of things, but let's talk briefly about the attributes of God, because much the same thing holds true for this category as well. Well, much can be known about God from creation, that God is eternal, that he's all-powerful, that he's good, from Paul in Romans chapter 1, verse 20. Whatever we learn about God through nature and general revelation is always going to be limited by the very nature of the infinite and triune God who reveals himself through finite and created things. Such revelation is inevitably corrupted by human sinfulness. And so whenever sinful people 
whatever sinful people learn about God through nature is always going to be grossly distorted. And ironically, it ends up serving as the basis for all forms of false religion and idolatry. That theme developed by Paul in Romans 1, 18 through 32. And John Calvin was absolutely correct when he speaks of the minds of sinful men and women as idol factories. And that idol factory is working overtime to turn out ranks of folks who are comfortable turning within and identifying with some form of contemporary American spirituality. Now, sinful human curiosity often leads finite men and women to speculate about God's hidden essence or to seek to unite themselves to that essence in some mystical and subjective way. And that's why it is so important to remind ourselves that God condescends to reveal himself to us in his word, scripture, primarily in and through the work and person of Jesus Christ. In the word of God, we find divine attributes or perfections that are ascribed to God. So rather than speculate about God's hidden essence, we must worship and serve the God who is, not a God we invent or we hope to find by looking within. Christian theologians have long struggled to explain how it is that certain of these divine perfections belong to God alone, while others are also ascribed to humanity, since we are created in God's image. And we'll take up that discussion a bit in our third lecture. The former attributes are most often identified as incommunicable attributes because these particular attributes cannot be communicated by God to humans, precisely because we are finite creatures. The latter are called communicable attributes because they're in fact communicated to humanity, although in finite measure due to creaturely limit limitations and only by analogy. And as we take up then these attributes, we have to keep in mind that these are perfections which God alone possesses in all their fullness, and they reveal a great deal to us about God's divine being. And it's these attributes that cause so much unease and confusion among our contemporaries. When we speak of God's incommunicable attributes, we think of things such as divine simplicity, that God is an infinite spirit, not the sum of different parts. Makes God as simple as attributes can be said to be identical with his being. God is also self-existent, his aseity. We can in no sense say that God is dependent on anything outside himself for his existence his glory, or his purpose. We can speak of God as eternal. He's without beginning nor end. God now is. He always was. He always will be. God fills all of creation with his perfections. God is said to be immortal because he, unlike us, is not mortal. It's but another way of saying that God is eternal. He does not live or die as we do. He's life itself. We may also speak of God as invisible, because he, unlike us, is pure spirit and not visible to the human eye. We speak of God as immutable, because he does not change as to his essence or his purpose. And we can speak of God as impassable, because, unlike his creatures, God is independent from the world he's made, and his divine essence is not subject to external influences, like suffering or passions. Although the persons of the Godhead are said to act in response to his creatures, but his divine essence or his purpose never changes. The so-called communicable attributes are important to mention as well. These perfections include those attributes that begin with the uh, prefix omni to distinguish the way in which we as creatures possess these attributes from the absolute fullness in which God possesses them. And these include things like omniscience and omnipresence and omnipotence as well as other attributes without the omni prefix like goodness and love and mercy and holiness and righteousness and jealousy. And so although our knowledge of God is finite and limited, because we are finite and limited, God is omniscient. He knows all things. And although we exercise creaturely power and freedom, God alone is properly said to be all-powerful and therefore sovereign over all things. And although we occupy both time and space, God transcends all spatial and temporal limitations. He alone is omnipresent. Now, men and women can demonstrate goodness and love and mercy as a reflection of being created in the image of God. But he possesses these same attributes without limit 
and like the way these attributes are manifest in us. Take, for example, the fact that we know God loves us because his son Jesus suffered and died for our sins, 1 John 4.10. This is how God reveals himself to us. And it's clear that we're not to speculate about these divine perfections, nor attempt to ignore them when those perfections expose our limitations as creatures. Rather, we worship and adore the God who reveals himself through such wonderful perfections. This is the God behind the big picture categories, the God who creates, the God who decrees the fall of our race without being the author of evil, the God who promises to redeem his people, a multitude so vast they cannot be counted, and who come from every race and tribe and tongue under heaven, and then does so in the person of Jesus, whose death for our sin and subsequent resurrection ushers in the new creation, which is our redemption, as well as a new heaven and a new earth. This is the God who reveals himself to us in his word, the same word from which we are to preach every Lord's Day. And it is the same word when preached that summons those who have taken this subjective turn to look outside themselves to their creator and redeemer, the God who is, not the God they like or the God they want. The challenges raised by contemporary American spiritualists to the Christian doctrine of God, including the creator-creature distinction, the doctrine of the Trinity and God's revealed attributes, all of that can be boiled down to a very simple and fundamental confession. You've heard it. I won't worship a God like that. But isn't that really a confession that if I were God, I'd do things differently? The God who is and who was from the beginning directly threatens intellectual autonomy so endemic to American spirituality, while at the same time revealing in his law and in the divine image of his creatures restrictions upon libertine sexual behavior, which are now the norm, and which drives much of this renewed animus toward traditional Christian theism. Many of the American spiritualists claim that their best life now is one free from all external constraints so long as their choices don't harm others, which is the only ethical norm acknowledged throughout much of contemporary American spirituality and culture. But this is a fool's errand since all our choices necessarily are interconnected with those around us. And can we make any choice? Can we commit any human act that is, has no impact on anyone else? Now, as the big picture reveals to us, we're creatures. Although we are fearfully and wonderfully made, God is God, and that means we're not. The God who is and is distinct from his creation and all its creatures is not the God envisioned and embraced by contemporary American spiritualists. Because behind this redemptive historical big picture lie the categories of creation, fall, redemption, and recreation. And behind that is the God who is. The God of the Bible enters into human history in the person of his son. And he exposes all the gods that are conjured up by our contemporaries for what they really are. Sophisticated idols. And to make this clear throughout our preaching requires the categories and doctrines of our theological system, which you're presently learning here at Westminster, and which provide the conceptual framework through which we preach God's word. Now, if we do this well, we can connect individual passages and verses to broader theological themes found throughout Scripture, i.e. the categories. This will help our hearers to connect the doctrinal dots. And so when we come to these doctrinal passages, and as we've seen, they're everywhere, it's certainly worth a sentence or two of explanation as well as perhaps a few cross-references. So let's talk about one example drawn from the text we've just considered. The creation account points to the creator-creature distinction. Creation is an act attributed to all three persons of the Godhead, the Father primarily, but to the Son and the Spirit as well, and reflects the glory of the Creator. So, for example, when you take up the Gospel of John and you preach upon the prologue, you immediately discover that that passage presupposes knowledge of the creation account. It speaks profoundly about the deity of Jesus. It speaks about his role in creation and how his incarnation is fulfilling something that had been begun back in the days of Moses. That passage, as with many others, 
requires at least at some level a systematic interpretation. And that's true for many texts and for all of the big picture categories. The very act of preaching the biblical text as informed by the categories given us in systematic theology is going to help us address and respond to virtually all the impulses of the subjective turn that are so typical of current American spirituality. Through this word preached, God calls us outside ourselves. And in order for our congregations to understand what the Bible teaches, we have to be able to relate particular biblical texts to other biblical texts and then simply and clearly define the doctrines they collectively reveal throughout the Bible. And that, brothers and sisters, is why our preaching ought to be informed by a systematic theology which is grounded in and which arises from, directly from, God's word. Let's close in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for your word and for the wonderful things it reveals to us and how it exposes our sinfulness and our propensity to create uh, idols in our sinful hearts. And so we pray, Father, that you will give to us the ability to understand your word, to connect the dots uh, carefully and systematically and in ways that bring glory and honor to the Savior to whom they point. Give us compassion, Lord, for those who are perishing in their sins, those who are deep in the subjective turn, who as they turn in will find nothing uh, but darkness. And so we pray, Father, that you will rescue them and us from that sin that lay within. We're thankful, Father, for the light of your word, which exposes our sin and points us to a Savior who gave himself for us. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kim, again for your challenging and uh, uh, relevant topic for us to consider, especially for theological education here at seminary as well. So we're grateful for your time. For those of you who missed yesterday's lecture, it's uh, available on the school's YouTube channel. Yes, we do have one. And so please do check it out and join us tomorrow at 10 o'clock, sa uh, same time and same place for the final lecture. At this time, outside, outside the foyer, we have some refreshments ready. So